Greetings, fellow investors. I'm Matthew Cochran, a lead advisor at 7investing, where it is our mission to empower you to invest in your future. We do that by providing monthly stock recommendations to our premium members and educational content that is freely available to everyone. Listeners, today I'm very excited to introduce John Maxfield. We had him on last year. I'm excited to talk to him again. Uh, he is a longtime writer in the banking space, and he's currently the executive director of the Wilmers Integrity Prize, named after Robert Wilmers, the longtime CEO of MMT Bank. Uh, John was the editor-in-chief for Bank Director Magazine. He was previously the senior banking specialist at The Motley Fool. He uh, still regularly writes for Bank Director Magazine and bankdirector.com. His work has been syndicated widely to national publications, uh, including USA Today, Time, Business Insider. He's been a guest on CNBC. Uh, currently, he recently launched his Maxfield on Bank Substack, which we'll let him tell you all about before we're done with today's episode. Um, John, oh, let me, you know, I said this last year, but it bears repeating. Uh, when I was younger, not young, but younger, starting out my writing career, uh, one of my first editors said, oh, uh, if you're interested in covering financials and, and fintech, you should follow John Maxfield. And ever since, I've been a regular reader of everything he writes that I can get my hands on. Uh, that was excellent advice. Uh, he's one of the best banking analysts I know. And more than that, John is really a student of banking, and I can't wait to talk to him today. John, welcome to the show. Well, I appreciate it, Matt, very much. I, I It's like, I think so fondly back on our, like the Motley Fool days, you know what I mean? Yes. Uh, and it's like, we've all kind of gone out, we still all kind of have this, like, this kind of like community and network, and it's like, it's so fun to be do, doing all this stuff together. It, it's great. I, I totally agree with you. The, uh, the, the friendships I made there there were some truly spectacular people and spectacular writers that I, I still follow. It's a great fraternity, uh, you know, for lack of a better word. For sure, for sure. Uh, John, you know, we had you on last year, as I already mentioned, uh, you know, and I want to have you on more, but the problem with banking, John, it's just so boring. Nothing ever happens in the banking industry. You know, it's like, what could we possibly talk about when we talk about banking? It's true. There's like, and particularly right, right now, it's like particularly quiet in the banking scene. Uh, like, yeah, I don't even know whispers, what you're whispers. About. You have to really like look past the front page to really get to like some stories. Um, so obviously I kid, uh, there is a lot going on in banking. Uh, John, you know, I think you have to be living under a rock to not know the headlines, um, you know, uh, just within the last month. Silicon Valley Bank was shut down by regulators. Um, you know, the FDIC took control. Shortly after that, Signature Bank was the next casualty. Um, you know, I think that was the third biggest bank failure in U.S. history. John, like, why don't you tell us? I think we know the common narrative, and, and maybe that's all there is to it. But, like, what exactly happened with Silicon Valley Bank and, and Signature Bank, like what, what's the what's the real story there? All right, so let, let me start with this. Um, when you think about the banking, like the banking industry as a system, like what we're going through right now kind of illustrates a really important point about it. And that is that the banking industry is in a, it kind of exists in an unstable equilibrium, or kind of goes in and out of an unstable equilibrium. And what I mean by that is that, so if you're in a stable equilibrium, when you go out of equilibrium, you go out of it in a linear way. So it's like dominoes. You click the dominoes and then the, the, the force is relatively similar, although as they click all the way down, right? In an unstable equilibrium, so this is like a, like a chemical compound, for example, that it has to stay within a very specific temperature range. If it gets out of that, it'll like explode. When it explodes, that is not a linear process. It's more like exponential. It's, it's more like nuclear fusion as opposed to like dominoes, right? Because as it goes out, it gains momentum as it goes out. Okay. And what you see with a banking panic, like we're experiencing right now, although it's dissipating, um, is that when something happens, then the effects get bigger. They, they, they get magnified throughout as they kind of travel throughout the industry. 
And so when you think about what's going on right now, you can trace it all the way back to one decision at Silicon Valley Bank. And this is what that decision was. So in the, when the coronavirus pandemic began, the government comes in and floods the US with fiscal and monetary stimulus to offset a 30% annualized decline in GDP, which is worse than even the Great Depression, okay? So they flood all this money into the economy. And where does a lot of that money go? Well, it goes to like the VC world and like the startup world. And if you recall back in like 2020, the latter half of 2020, the first half of 2021, there's a huge IPO boom. Um, there's all these companies rushing to go public because the valuations that they were that they were earning were so huge. And so you had all this money flood in. Well, Silicon Valley Bank is the bank for those companies, those startup companies. And so those companies would go out, get all this money, and then they would put it on in an account at Silicon Valley Bank, and then that would be their operating account, okay? So all this money floods into Silicon Valley Bank. And about in, so at the end of like 2019, they had about $61 billion in deposits. Within two years, that had grown to $190 billion. So just like $130 billion in cash just flooded into this bank. Okay, so it tripled its size. It's all this, it's just a deluge of cash. So this, this, the chief financial officer is sitting there saying, okay, what am I going to do with all this money? What am I going to do with all this money? And he basically had three choices. He could buy, he could, they, could make or, they could make or buy loans. They could buy securities or they could leave it in cash. Well, the problem with leaving it in cash is that it costs money to service those accounts but they would be earning no money. So they'd just be on a net loss type of situation. If they made loans, well, you cannot grow a loan portfolio that fast, right? Or it's you're just doing right. stuff and you're going to face an inordinate, an, an inordinate amount of credit risk. So that left them basically saying, all right, I guess we're going to buy some securities. And so at that, that point, they came. They, this now comes the critical decision that was made. They say, okay, what are we going to do? What type of securities are we going to buy? And what is the duration of those securities that we're going to buy? And what they did is they took, there's these asset liability models that banks use to balance their balance sheet, to make sure that the duration of their assets matches the duration of their liabilities. And what those models say is that the duration of a non-interest bearing deposit, so like a checking account, right? It's, it's almost like an indefinite duration. Like this is the longest duration liability on the balance sheet, okay? And so that means that you look for long dated assets to match that up against. So, so they're looking at this model and saying, oh, we have, you know, income's $130 billion worth of this stuff and it's all long dated. So they go out and say, well, let's go buy long dated assets. And so they go and they buy a ton. They buy, I can't remember, it's like $70 billion worth of mortgage backed securities. You got to buy a bunch of long dated treasury certificate, uh, treasury securities, and that locks them in to where when the, if the rates eventually rise, and, and they were basically making a huge bet that rates were not going to rise because if rates ever rose, the value of that, that portfolio would, would decline. And that's kind of what set everything in motion. But on the surface, these weren't risky assets, right? I mean, these were like, these are like stable assets. This wasn't like the, a financial crisis. They weren't out making bad loans. They weren't out buying, you know, bad mortgages. I mean, they were trying, I mean, they obviously were going to get to like the, the huge mistake and you already got there, but like, like on the surface, th these aren't bad assets to own. The problem was the interest rate risk. If you were to go back and just like flop yourself down into the middle of 2020, and then some, somebody showed you Silicon Valley's balance sheet, and they say, is this risky or conservative? You'd say, that is really, really conservative. Really conservative. Because right. they, they bought GSC. So these are government implicitly guaranteed securities. Um, so yeah, it looked really, really conservative. So they, um, you, you know, obviously interest rates did rise. And, and is that just what caught up to them and, and set this whole thing off? So they, the, the mistake they made was that all these additional deposits that flooded in, these are not like normal deposits. This is like, it's like a windfall. It's like a windfall profits in a sense. And so they shouldn't have, they sh the mistake they made was but to treat them like normal deposits. 
and, or for asset liability management. They should just said, look, you know what? Like they should have either taken it off their balance sheet and just put in money market funds or just left it. And I mean, all this stuff is easy as a Monday morning quarterback. Let's be sure, very clear, right? sure. Like they were facing a lot of pressures at the time to figure out what to do with it because the analysts were on the conference call saying, how are you going to support your net interest income, right? And so, you know, they're trying to figure all this stuff out, right? Um, but in hindsight, you know, they should have either left it in cash and just taken the hit or you know, maybe to, to done, done some sort of off balance sheet arrangement where they put it in, in, in money market mutual funds or something like that. Um, but they didn't. And so what they had is they were sitting on this portfolio of, I can't remember how big it eventually was, uh, it's hundred and must've been 140, 150. $50 billion worth of long dated securities. And so when the in interest rates rose and the interest rates didn't just rise, I mean, starting at the beginning of 2022, I mean, they went up further and faster than ever before, even faster than the early 1980s when Paul Volcker went in and, and, and attacked inflation. And so sure. that happened. I mean, they just like the value of that thing just, just plummeted. Um, and so what, and then the, their customers watching that saying, Oh my God, if you mark to market all those securities, this bank is insolvent. And so then that's when Thiel and Andreessen and these VC guys told their portfolio companies, get your money out. And then once that started, that, that was the run that started. That, that was the beginning of the end. That was the beginning of the end. Like uh, the, the, the bank run. And, and it, it, it's also one of the problems, I, I, you, you kind of hinted at it, but like with Silicon Valley, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it, this isn't, a, a normal bank as far as they're, they're not like most of these, like you said, like a lot of this was stimulus money that went to the VC world. And, uh, you, you know, we had super low interest rates. N none of this Silicon Valley bank is not really made up of like families opening up their like, you know, normal checking account, nor quote unquote normal, but you know what I mean? This isn't middle-class America, uh, like checking and savings accounts. This is like a lot of this, so much of this was, from the VC world. Yeah, so this is a bank that's, that serves a very specific niche, and that is that caters to the entrepreneurs who run these companies, um, these startup companies, and the companies themselves. And so to give you a sense for like how what that means in terms of quantitative statistics, um, the average account at Silicon Valley was uh, had $2.9 million in it going into 2020. And then by 2021, once all that additional money flooded in, the average account at Silicon Valley had $4.9 million in it. Now that is really important because the FDIC only guarantees up to $250,000 worth of deposits. Although the now in, in hindsight, now they've done some things to guarantee them all. But like uh, at the time, it only guaranteed up to $250,000 worth. So what that meant is that Literally 95% of the deposits at Silicon Valley were not insured by the FDIC. Whereas at a typical bank, it'll be like 77, 78, 80% of deposits are or more are guaranteed by the FDIC. So, like, if, you know, as those people watched what was going on, they said, like, I mean, this is like basically like a bank run back in the, back in the day when, when people were literally just afraid that they were going to lose all their money. Right. Uh, and so that's why it happened so fast. They lost, I think they lost $40 billion in one day. That's, that's just incredible. Uh, let's, I mean, there's a lot I just want to pick pick your brain on today. Um, but like, since it, 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 it came up, let, let's, can we talk a little about FDIC insurance? Uh, you know, it covers, like you mentioned, and I think most people at least know this or have an idea of this, that, you know, FDIC insurance covers deposits up to $250,000 per account. Should that be more like we hear a lot of people saying like, well, like, why don't we just cover all accounts? And one, is that feasible? And is that better? Okay, so this is, um, this is a, this is less a banking question than it is a social question. So if you think about what the FDIC is, it's basically a, a it's a, it's a, it's a cog in the social safety net. Right. It's just a, it's a piece of that. And so, um, I mean, from the banking perspective, what it does is it reduces the incentive to run on banks. So that's really helpful. Right. right. But you're never going unless you unless you guarantee them all the way up to the top, you're never going to completely eliminate the incentive to run on a bank because you have these large depositors 
who are sophisticated and who stay up to date on things and who they, there's just no way to guarantee all their, you know, all their deposits all the way up to the top. And so like, those are the folks that run that those are the folks that cause runs on banks. And this goes back to like, so there's a big bank that failed in 1984 called Continental Illinois. It was a big bank in Chicago. It was the sixth or seventh biggest bank in the country at the time. And um, a big wholesale bank. And it had depositors from like uh, uh, Japan and Europe and all over the all over the world. And it got caught buying these loans from this bank in Oklahoma that turned out to be no good. The publicity, the, the, it got publicity as a result of that. These depositors learned about it. And then they started withdrawing their, their money out in, in mass out of that bank. Um, and so like, this is really the modern kind of style. So ever since the mid eighties, this is really the modern style of bank run. Um, and it's still going on today. So I guess, should then there be a cap though? Like it, it, it almost seems silly, I guess. Like I could have 50 bank accounts with $250,000. And that's all insured if it's different bank accounts at, you know, 50 different banks or even like a checking account and a savings account at 25 different banks. Uh, should it just be a cap per entity? Like, I, it just seems like, I don't know, like maybe, uh, and, and, you know, normally I'm, I'm really not a, a big regulation guy and, and this could be misguided, um, but uh, like, is there... It, it almost just seems silly that it's by per account than like per entity or per person, or is there a purpose for that that I don't understand? So there is um, kind of to your point, like right now, there's basically an implicit guarantee of all big banks deposits. Like they're not going to let JP Morgan fail. I mean, it'd okay. just be, it'd be cataclysmic for the United US economy, but they sure. will let f and bank fail and wherever it is, you know, like um, Lubbock, Texas, right? Because like, who cares if it's, if it's not systemically important, let it fail. But like, that brings up questions of like, like fairness. Like, why can this bank do stupid stuff? And just because right. it's it's saved and like this little bank, like it does less stupid stuff, but like it doesn't get saved. You know what I mean? So there's, there, there, there are fairness issues related to this, but here's the thing about um, deposit insurance. So if you give unlimited deposit insurance, you uh, expose the country to an enormous amount of financial risk. So if you go back to like the 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, like the crisis and how it um, uh, kind of uh, spread over into Europe and then what happened over there with those countries, remember like Ireland goes in and had to rescue its, I think, I don't know how many of its banks I had to rescue, but we had to rescue one of its really big banks. Like it basically bankrupted the entire country. Um, I can't remember if Sweden or Finland or Norway. It was one of those Scandinavian countries had a very similar situation. And so you, you have to be careful with banks because you, let's say you and I want to start a bank. There's literally an infinite demand for credit. Like if you make the terms easy right. enough and the, low, the rate low enough, you and I could start a bank and then the, People did this in the SNL crisis. They would go in and buy these SNLs and then just grow them from like 10 million in assets to like 50 or like four or five, six billion over the course of like a year or two. I mean, you could literally grow it as big, as fast as you want it. Right. You don't want to expose your government to that, right? And so the question is like, how do you, you know, dance that fine line? And, you know, I think it's, it's a conversation that's going on right now in, in Washington. And it, it's, it's not an easy one just because and it's not just because it's politics but just because like it's just hard to figure out what to do no that's that's a great point it's like it, it, and you know i think maybe the recency bias in all of us certainly me you you want to figure out how we could have prevented this current crisis and how we could have prevented like what's going on right now without thinking like well you know look just 15 years ago you know, there's another crisis caused by different reasons. And, you know, like, it, I guess it's always a matter of like weighing the pros and cons of everything and looking beyond just maybe the most current uh, shiny crisis. You know, one thing I would, I would say is that like, when you're, we, and this is going to sound really rid ridiculous, but I'm not sure crises are bad. Because if you don't have crises, you don't have the run up. And let me, let me give you a specific example. So there's a guy by the name of Jay Cook. 
And Jay Cook was like the banker, the financier of the day back in the Civil War. And like the, the like nobody in Washington thought that they would able they would ever be able to sell enough bonds to finance the union's effort in the Civil War. Well, they were because they got Jay Cook. Jay Cook was really the first person to figure out how to like mass market government bond the sale of government bonds. And I mean, I can't remember what battle it was after Appomattox or something like that, but Grant basically said like had it not been for jay cook like i don't know if we could have financed this war. i don't know if we could have won this war right right after the war uh and jay cook he comes from a, this really good family I mean, these people were like upstanding citizens they're, fan, they're fantastic people and the government goes to jay cook and says like hey we're trying to shore up the northern border of the united states because the brits are trying to come down and, you know, the way you shore up a border like that is you populate that area. The way you populate that area at the time is you build a railroad. So they're building the Northern Pacific. But the issue is that they're having problems financing it. Well, if you have problems financing something, you go to Jay Cook. If it's back in the 1860s and 1870s. So they go to Jay Cook. They said, what can you do for us? And he said, look, I'll, 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 I'll take care of the financing of this. He takes care of the financing, basically takes it all onto his own balance sheet. And there's a panic at the time. It causes his bank to go down. And then his bank, it was a bank in Philadelphia. And it, the, when his bank failed, because it was, it was like, I mean, it would be like J.P. Morgan failing, J.P. Morgan Chase. I mean, it was that, that significant. That caused a wave of other bank failures um, um, after that. But the point is that like, so you look at that and you say like, yeah, like the panic of 1873 and the resulting depression afterwards was bad and nobody liked it and blah, blah, blah. But like, we got the Northern Pacific and we shored up that border. You know what I mean? So it's like, it wasn't worth it. I don't know, but like, it's not clearly one way or the other. It's, it's definitely a sure. close call. Interesting. That's a, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, let's, let's move on. Like uh, I want to talk to you like just a little bit about like uh first Republic because, and what makes this interesting to me and uh, you know, in my uh, limited knowledge of banks like First Republic was like what I would call a quote unquote good bank. Like they're renowned for their customer service. Uh, you know, like like uh, by all accounts, like they had like the best customer service in the banking industry. Um, all I ever heard were like amazing things. Like you go into the banks and there was free umbrellas to grab because in case it started raining while you were in there, you know, you grab the free umbrella. Uh, just think little things like that uh, were always the antidote you heard, but just like the great customer service. And now. Uh, First Republic is in trouble, and uh, you know, over the last year, their stock stock price is down uh, ninety, almost ninety three percent. Over the last week, I mean, this has been a whipsaw, like a roller coaster. Uh, you know, down down forty six percent in the uh, uh, in the last week, but uh, in between, like just this week, I mean, it's been up and down, uh, just a total roller coaster ride for shareholders. Uh, is this was this a good bank? Was I wrong? And, and you know, if, if it is a good bank, like how does I guess like you know how come like this even these kinds of crises can hit quote unquote good banks? So uh, I share the your same opinion of First Republic that it is a very good bank, um, but it suffered from two unfortunate associations. Uh, one is that it was in the same geographic area and would have had many of the same clients. Right, is the San Francisco area. Sure. And the second is that because it too served high net worth clients and businesses, it also had a small percentage of its deposits that were insured by the FDIC. And so I think in its case, I think 80% of its deposits were uninsured, 20% were insured. So again, it created this like fear that, like, oh God, if this one goes down, I'm just gonna, it's not like I'm gonna be inconvenienced because I'm not gonna be able to give my money for a while, but like some of that money could go to money heaven for good. You know what I mean? Right. And so, like that's kind of what caused that, 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 that contagion over to First Republic. And what's interesting is that there was a study done in 1921 of bank failures. There were a whole bunch of banks, or 1920, it was in the mid, I think it was maybe 1925 or 1926. There were a whole bunch of banks, there were thousands of bank failures a year in the 1920s. This is the decade before the Great Depression because there was a drought that spread across the uh, United States. I said, all these rural banks failing all over the place. And there's a, a group of folks down in Florida, near your neck of the woods, who said, let's do a study of bank failures to see why they fail. 
And they found that like 20% failed because of like the drought, 10% failed because of making bad loans, like 5% failed because of bad legislation. Like there's a variety of different things that add up 50%. But then they said, but 50% of banks fail as a result of idle gossip, rumors. These rumors about that, that were untrue about the health of a bank spread for whatever reason would cause these otherwise healthy banks to fail. And, you know, it's been a long time. If you think back on the financial crisis that we had, you know, 15 years ago, like, those, like typically the banks have failed, probably deserve to be to fail because they've got overextended on commercial real estate or, you know, you know the uh, 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 subprime mortgage type of stuff. But like, it's been a while since like a really decent bank has failed just as a consequence of contagion. And like, that's, that's my reading of what the situation with First Republic is. Yeah, a writer who I follow recently said, like, capital isn't king, confidence is uh, for banks. Uh, that might be, so is, is that the case with, with First Republic? That writer is you, by the way, like your sub stack. <laughs> but uh, like, it, like, so is, you know, how do banks maintain confidence? Um, you know, like, or how do you, is, is there anything a bank can do uh, when, when that starts happening? It, you know, if that's true, like what, what can banks do, I guess. So, um, so that is, so here's, what's interesting about that. Do I have the power to share screen? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I do. Can, can I share a, a chart with you? Yeah, absolutely. Hold on. Let me just pull this up real quick. Um, I don't know if that just caused my screen to go blank, but give me just one second. I'll, cause this will really illustrate the point, um, really well. Okay. Let's see here. All right here. Okay, great. Um, and let me go over and share it. Okay. All right. So um, can you see it? Yes. All right. So this is, so this is going to go to that point about uh, confidence is king. Capital is, is, is court jester. So there's this in, in banking, there's this saying that like confidence is king, right? Confidence is king, confidence, is, or I mean, capital is king, capital is king, capital is king. Like, that's what everybody says. And it, this came out of the last financial crisis where we had people saying like, the reason we had a financial crisis and so many banks failed is because like they were, they didn't have enough capital on their balance sheet. Okay. So that's the, that is, that's what most people think in banking today. Okay. Right. Not true. Okay. So let's start with, but let's, let's start with, um, go back to that crisis. So what was the biggest bank failure of the crisis? That crisis is Washington Mutual. It's the biggest bank failure of all time, 300 plus billion dollars in assets. If you look at the second quarter of 2008, which was the last quarter of which it reported before it was failed, um, it had the highest tier one common capital ratio of any big bank. It was higher than JP Morgan Chase, higher than Citi, higher than US Bank Corp, or Bank of America, higher than Wells. Okay. And you think like, if capital is king, and they just raised $9 billion from a private equity firm called TPG, if capital was king, that thing would still be around, okay? Um, and then same thing with Silicon Valley Bank. Like, this is how its tier one common capital ratio stacked up against the other big banks. It was less than JP Morgan and City, but it was more than Bank of America, Wells, and M&T. And so the point is that, like, uh, the way the reason I say the capital is court jester, not king, is because it distracts everybody. Everybody's looking. Oh, the, there's plenty of capital. Everything's fine. You know what I mean? Like, but it, there's not, if, it doesn't matter if you have ten percent capital or twelve percent capital. Because what matters is that you have eighty-eight percent assets or ninety percent assets that could, like, if you if those are bad assets, they'll just crush that additional sure two percent. Sure. So. So what is, so what, what, I mean, and doesn't, so doesn't regulation though focus, I mean, the regu regulation is all about the, the capital requirements. Am I wrong there? I mean, it seems like, again, much more limited understanding. So correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it seems like the regulation where they do the stress test, it's about how much capital they have, how much liquidity. Am, am I wrong there? Is, is regu are regulations focused on the wrong thing? So I th the answer to that is both yes and no. So um, like the purpose of the stress test, so is to like ultimately decide, just determine if there's enough capital to survive, you know, and liquidity to survive at some sort of like cataclysmic downturn, right? Sure. But because the stress tests are so public, 
they're also meant to induce confidence in the system. So it's not like it's not like it, these two things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Although outside of a very small group of people who understand these nuances, right. those nuances are, are lost on most people. And so then they just reduce it to capital or capital is king. You know okay. what I mean? So sure. they, they'll like, you know, you look at the, you know, all the banking publications, financial publications will rank the banks every year based on a variety of different things. And they have five different metrics of say efficiency, uh, profitability, um, um, uh, credit losses, cap credit losses, and uh, capital. And the capital is it takes the form of safety. It, it just it, there's just no correlation. I mean, I, I haven't been able to discern any correlation between the safety of a bank and the amount of capital it, it holds. As as crazy as that sounds, it sounds I, insane. It sounds it sounds counterintuitive to uh, almost like uh, common sense. Well, and because here's the thing, like you go back in time to like the eight, nine, the, late, the, the 1980s, the late 1980s, where you had these, this SNL crisis. And so you had in the beginning of the SNL crisis, you had a mismatch crisis because interest rates were high, short-term interest rates were high, long-term interest rates were lower. So you had, they paid more for their deposits than they were earning on their loans. Well, then these bank, what these SNLs did is they then got into these other areas doing stupid stuff like buying junk bonds and like getting into CRE type of deals and all this kind of stuff that they had no experience getting into to, to offset that. Well, what then when these companies would go out and they'd be saying like, give us your deposits, we'll pay you 7%, 8%, 12% on your deposits. And they'd be putting these ads in newspapers. And in these ads in the newspapers, they'd be saying, we have three times as much capital as is required by the federal government. So we are safe. Right. Sure. But then these things, I mean, the stuff, I mean, some of these had like 90% of their loans were bad. So it didn't matter if they had three wow. times as much capital because 90% of their loans were bad. I mean, just like, it just is like a, it was like a pebble in front of a bulldozer. You know what I mean? And so the problem with it is that like, if you don't understand the nuance, it can really, you can, it can, you can really fool you to think that like, it is indeed uh, synonymous with safety. So without, I think I know what you're going to say, but without like diving into a bank's loan book, which is virtually impossible. Like, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I can't even fathom how many loans are on the books of like regional banks, much alone, much less like JP Morgan or Bank of America without piling through that and then trying to evaluate each one. How, you know, if you can't look at capital, you know, in how much capital a bank has, uh, how can you e evaluate when a bank is good or or when it's bad? Okay, so the, where I've where I've settled on this is that um, so first of all, when you 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 look at a bank's financial statements, like it's like it's like Candyland. It's like it, it's like, <laughs> this, is like it's a, this is not because they're trying to make it up, but it's like. The accounting rules are different and all these different things. And it's like, you're, you're kind of guessing at valuations because you don't know, you're, you're sitting on a whole bunch of loans, but you don't know if they're going to be good or bad. But right. the, the loan is good, is only good once it's paid off. Until then, you, have, you don't know if it's good or bad. So you're sitting on a loan portfolio that you don't know if it's good or bad, right? Okay. And so you, like you, you just, it's, you, there's no way to look at these financial documents and to discern anything of of, of much value from them at all. I, I hate to say it, but it's like, that's just the case. And I studied this stuff for a long time. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yep. So what I have fallen uh, is that um, the thing to do is what, what I do is the first thing I do when I look at a bank is I look at how it performed the last crisis because the, the cost of goods. So those loans have now been all the way through and processed through the book. So we know how, the, how those have performed. So you look, how did it perform in the last crisis? If it made it through without losing any money, that's kind of what you're looking for, okay? And then you want to see, well, if they made it through without losing money, is there a continuity of management, right? Either the same management or, you know, the same actual CEO, or, you know, there's a friendly success, you know, succession uh, at the bank, right? And so that's kind of what you're looking for. But really where I have settled is this. You cannot, because you cannot rely on the numbers in their balance sheet and income statement and all this kind of stuff. You have to rely on the people that are running these things. What you see is that the people who have run the best banks, the Robert Wilmers is, the Mick Blodnicks, 
the Goggins out in Boston at Hingham Institution for Savings. Like these folks, the thing that they share in common is that they're all committed to their fiduciary duties and specifically the fiduciary duty against self-dealing. And what that means is they put the, in, their, the, 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 the interests of their organization above themselves. And that's important in banking because banking is not rocket science. Okay. Like it is not complicated. And like, it just isn't. And like, I don't care what anybody says. It's really, really simple. Okay. But if you try to overcomplicate it, uh, or if you, if you're looking out for yourself and not the entity, like that's, that's where things are going to happen. If you're just like, you care about the entity, you're not trying to overcomplicate it. You can earn 12%, 14% of your equity just every single year, just every bang, 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 every single right. year. So that that's really the key. So you have to assess the individuals, try to get like get to know them, read what they write, see if there's any speeches that they give on YouTube, like, and then just at, take your mind out of stock market brain and put your brain in like normal person brain and say, does this seem like a trustworthy person? You know sure. what I mean? Like, do, you know, do they make eye contact? What's their handshake like? Like, what are the what what is the feeling you get about them as a person? Um, and that that's what I would say. That's uh. That's all very good. Let me let, let's let's pivot again though, um, because there's there's just so many things I want to talk to you about. Uh, one of them being uh, Credit Suisse uh, merged with UBS. So I know this is over in Europe. I'm not sure exactly like if this is as much in your wheelhouse or not. Um, but this is just a copy of the press release. But like, um, there's there's a, uh, you know, uh, they. Um, you know, the Swiss are kind of blaming the U.S. banking crisis too, um, you know, which is why I highlighted this article. If you're watching on YouTube, if, if you're just listening on the podcast, um, you know, I just have a, the, the headline reads, the Swiss claim the U.S. banking crisis ultimately toppled Credit Suisse, but are they right? Um, you know, Credit Suisse chairman said the latest de developments that emanated from the banks in the U.S. hit us at the most unfavorable moment. One time, like last year, we were able to able to overcome the deep market uncertainty, but not this second time. SMB chairman lamented the U.S. banking crisis uh, for accelerating a loss of confidence in Switzerland, which had repercussions for Credit Suisse's liquidity. Uh, so let's let's go across the pond and like what what happened with Credit Suisse? Well, it got cut. I mean. The Swiss authorities are right. It got caught up in this in in this kind of this melee. But the, where they're wrong is that like Credit Suisse like steps in the middle of everything. <laughs> like there's something bad. <laughs> like, it, it seems like since I've been an investor, it, like uh, you know, you have a joke about Citibank, and it, you go back like a hundred years for it. You know, I can't go back a hundred years on Credit Suisse, but I can go back like 10, 12 years, and it just seems like they are just constantly mired in scandal or like trouble or you know like oh we're they got caught banking with the terrorists or you know i mean just like time after time again they're just always in trouble it's like at the it's like the guy who's always at the college party getting drunk you're like oh there's bill <laughs> bill's always at the party getting drunk you know what I mean? like, <laughs> right 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 exactly who i expected to see here you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's like they're just at the party getting drunk at every party you know what i mean like, right right and then Citigroup, but now I will say that Citigroup wasn't at this party. Like this is the first party in a hundred years they weren't at. And like, I guess we should we should come in. Let's, let's wait till it's over. Let's wait till <laughs> yeah. it's over. There's still time. There's still time. There's still time. Yeah. But like, like, so so how did the U.S. crisis affect Credit Suisse? And like, what's going on? You know, it, how big of a deal is this? Well, I mean, you know, uh, it's a big deal in, insofar as the size of Credit Suisse and the importance of it to the European financial system. I mean, it really is like a systematically important financial institution. Sure. Whereas, you know, there were arguments that that at least Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic were not systematically important. Although, like, I don't know if that's necessarily, I don't know if I like necessarily agree with that. Sure. Uh, for a variety of different reasons, just because like they started the contagion. So they're big enough to start the contagion. So like, isn't that systematically important? I don't know. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, it, it's just, a, it's just a bigger bank, but it, it's just the same. It's just the same type of stuff, a loss of confidence in these, in, in, in that bank because of um, kind of its reputation and, and its history. Yeah. 
you're on mute. We're talking on, sorry about that. We're talking on Friday, March 24th. Um, you know, this is going to be released early next week, but just last night, Moody's uh, said like, hey, uh, this turmoil, turmoil uh, can't be contained. And even though like, they're like, look, the, the U.S. is going to broadly succeed here, uh, quote unquote, but like a lot of this can't be contained. We're talking about contagion. Uh, like, are we still early innings in this crisis or is this game almost over? Like, wh where are we at right now, John? Like, is there a lot more bad news to come? And like, I guess like if more dominoes do fall, like where, you know, is there a place to look for these dominoes to fall? I mean, so let me just say a caveat. I mean, I don't know. I can't tell the future. You know what I mean? So I don't, I don't know exactly where we're at. I don't know if we're, we're near the end or, or where we are in that, in the progression, but I can just tell you that from, it seems like we're on the other side of it. Okay. It seems like we're on the other side of it now. Um, and then that was the result of kind of the things that the government did. It came in and said, like, we're going to guarantee, you know, the deposits of these banks, we're going to not, not, people aren't going to, the uninsured deposits aren't going to take a bunch of losses. They opened up this term limit lending facility. So they, they did a variety of different things, um, to kind of, to kind of stem the tide. Um, but yeah, and so, and so I, I think that's probably going to be like, it's not the first Republic is still suffering and it's still right. kind of living along and, and it's still kind of a TBD type of situation. And even if it survives, I think, you know, I thought it's not going to be the first Republic that how I'm does working. it come back? Like, yeah, how do you, I'll, like, how, like, I mean, it, it just seems to me like if you, I mean, I, I you're, you were talking about the deposits or that were withdrawn, like, you know, on a single day or whatever it was, it, you know, it's insane. Like how, I personally, like if I'm taking the trouble to withdraw my account from a bank because I don't have confidence in it, it's not like a, a week, a year later, I'm going to be like, hey, you know what? Let's, uh, I miss my old bank. Let me go, let me go back to it. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I was talking to um, a woman who's a CEO of a real estate company that we're friends with and they had, I don't know, they had, they were, they did 25 million came in and out of their accounts on a, on a weekly basis just because the deals that they were doing. And this was when, uh, it was going down, and I think so this would have been a week, uh, was two weeks ago or a week ago? It got the time, I'm in a time warp now. Uh, this would have been a week ago when First Republic was really going down, and they took, I think they've lost $70 billion in one day <laughs> in deposits. And she, she got in the queue to get her money, the, that company's money out there in the, in the wire queue. And I said, well, like, what, if the government comes in and, like, like guarantees everything, are you going to, like, like, you know, stop that? wire she said no no we're, we're gone and so it's just right, like right it's it's unfortunate because it was it was a really really it was a damn good bank you know and right. uh, but it's yeah i i don't i can't imagine it it anytime soon certainly getting back to where it, any, anywhere close to where it was you know going back to first republic uh you know we talked about like one of their like the, their achilles heel i guess was like having all these high uh high value accounts that weren't insured was that was that their mistake? Was there like bank like you know it, it it kind of targeted these accounts? Was that like their fundamental flaw? Like going back, was their strategy just flawed because it left them vulnerable to this kind of bank run? Well, I, 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 there they, I mean, like nobody's perfect, and they made a, a few mistakes. Sure. One of which is that they never priced their loans in a way that like that that totally accounted for the risk. I mean, you look at some of the mortgages they made, I mean, they were making them like a percent, I mean, like nothing hardly. And so right. uh, they, had, they had some loan pricing issues that like people that are in the know in the industry have been familiar with and, uh, for a while. Um, and then, but it's hard because it's like, did they, I mean, if they failed or it, given where they're at, as a result of that, they did something wrong because you're, you're, you're as the leaders of a financial institution, your ultimate responsibility is to make sure this thing survives. You know what I mean? Sure. And so sure, like, yeah. whether we, it's got to survive anything, including, a, you know, maybe unsolicited or like un, attacks that are unfair, you know what right, I mean? Like right, you right. To survive that too, you know? And so, so, you know, there's some culpability, I suppose there, but like, it certainly isn't anything that I wouldn't have, I couldn't, I, I'm not going to say that I would have done it any better. I don't think I would have. Right. 
right, right, right. No, of course. <laughs> of course. Could have. I don't know if Jamie Dimon could have once it got into that point. Right. So, you know, what is the mistake they made? I, you know, they, you know what I mean? Like, that's a good question. I mean, I, because they had a damn good model. Uh, at least like, again, like by, you know, by, by my, uh, you know, I never invested in it. I never had shares. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying anything like that, but like, uh, you know, it, it was uh popular, I shouldn't say popular, but there were people on Twitter who were like, Hey, this is a good bank. And this is why, uh, when I looked into it on a very surface level and it seemed like everything, like they were saying was true. It's generally a good bank. And, uh, like I said, their customer service was, was famous. Uh, for just being first rate all around and how they could cater to these high worth clients, whether that's individuals or uh, family offices or small businesses, like they just were nailing that market. Looking back on it, I just wonder maybe uh, because those accounts were uninsured, if that strategy was just fundamentally flawed, even though it was almost unforeseeable i maybe it was more foreseeable but like you know for at least me like you know they, they just the victim of the crisis well and the other question is that like so there are these devices and these products in the banking system that like if you have say 20 million dollars in deposit at a bank that this device can spread that money through all these different automatically spread that money through all these different banks um and so you are insured, but like it'll gotcha. show up deposit. They're called reciprocal deposits. So then, then you'll give two hundred fifty thousand dollars to this bank, and this bank needs to insure this two hundred fifty thousand. So you'll trade. You know what I mean? And, right. and now that we're talking, I don't know how those reciprocal deposits are accounted for in those uninsured deposit levels, because I would have a hard time imagining that that all those customers at First Republic were just willing to like fly blind like that without any sort of additional protection. My guess is that some of them use reciprocal. I could be wrong. Right. Um, I'm going to look into this actually. It's an interesting question, but like my guess is that some of them probably use that device. So probably maybe even the 80% number is, is o dramatically overstates it. I, I don't, I don't know the answer. To that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I, I, yeah. I'm more, I have a lot more questions than, than answers. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's just, it's just interesting because, you know, uh, they're not the the credit suisse or the city group at least you know at least they didn't appear to be um you know one thing <laughs> one thing i've always said you know and it's this current crisis maybe throws that in doubt uh you know was we had low interest rates for a very long time and when i would write about banks i was like well hey you know if interest rates go up that's really good for these banks because like you know so you buy them now and, you know, you, you hold them. And if interest rates grow up, go up, um, like, like that's, uh, you know, they're going to make money on their net interest margin. Uh, you know, it, was that wrong? <laughs> like was, were all these articles I wrote saying that wrong? Well, there are different, there are multiple levers that are pulled on a bank's balance sheet and P and L when interest rates rise and fall. One of the levers is that um, the securities portfolio drops in value, but you'll they they but the another level that off, helps helps to offset that is that the yield that they'll earn on their interest earning assets, like their loans or anything else they put on they knew that they put on their book, uh, will yield more. So then that's a net positive. Um, the other lever that higher and lower interest rates uh, influence is that if you jack up the interest rate really high. Uh, and you make it hard for anybody who's on a fixed rate loan to pay that loan, you're going to increase defaults as well. And so that's another level that the lever that factors in. So it's like, it's just trying to get the right, the right mixture of those, those levers, you know, and like, and how much leverage is on each lever um, that like the people at the, the banks, you know, keep a close eye on. And so they talk a lot about like asset and liability management. You want to match your assets up with your liabilities. And so that's kind of what that's all about. So the, the, the answer to your question is that there isn't a simple answer to your question. Right. It depends on how the balance, how the bank is, is, is kind of set, set up. Sure. Of course, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, again, you know, I kind of know how you're going to answer this, but like, you know, I've heard some people say like, why even have regional banks? Like, let's, you know, you look at Canadian, you look at Canada or some European countries where they just have like, a few major significant uh, banks and they get by on that. 
why have a system where we have, and I don't know the number, you probably do, but like, you know, a thousand, thousands of banks across this country. Like, why do we have that? Why can't we just have the big four and consolidate the rest? Okay, let me show you, let me share, let me show you another chart. Um, so this is, oh, no, I got to go to a different one, actually. Um, this is a really good one because this, I came across this data the other day and I was like, oh, that's, that is really interesting data. Um, uh, here we go. Uh, just so you know, I put parachutes on banks, Matt. So those are, those are, those banks are parachuting. All right. Got it. Yeah, I like it. I like it. <laughs> okay. Uh, here we go. So this right here is the, that shows the major uh, countries in the world relative to the number of banks. And as you can see, the United States has way more banks than even the second place. So we have about 4,500. Second place is Russia and they have about 400 and then everybody else is like in the hundreds basically. Okay. Uh, the question is, why do we have so many more banks? And the, the answer to that question is this. Well, let me actually show, now that we're on this chart, let me show an, even another chart. So, because um, this will help, this will help. Okay, this right here is, that's that shows the population, the, the trend in the population of banks over time in the United States. Okay. Okay. And what you see is a big buildup. It's starting in, in around the 1870s, 1880s. Okay. Yes. Yep. That is, is that is the birth of disposable income. So what happens there is you have the American Industrial Revolution, and then we're starting to ship all this stuff to Europe. So our trade balance goes from negative to positive. So all this money is flooding into the United States. It's the first time ever that just normal people have any sort of savings. So in like I think it was like in 1882, like the average savings account had four dollars in it. You wow. just have inflation, it's like whatever, 27 bucks yeah, a year, yeah. something yep. like that. Like, um, but they, they know there are no savings. Well, that totally changed. So you have the birth of disposable income taking place in the United States. This is a, not a banking thing. This is a human condition thing, right? You have all that money. So, so all these banks are like, well, banks arbitrage money. So like, well, let's start. Well, there's all this money. Like, let's start a bank and go arbitrage that money. You know what I mean? Right. But that's what caused that huge boom up to that peak, which is in 1921. And then 1921 is that's when the that drought throughout the rural Americas hits and they're losing thousands of banks a year. And then, of course, the Great Depression hits and we lose a whole bunch of banks in the Great Depression. OK, and so then you have this period of time after it kind of bottoms out and there's this right. period of time. It's kind of like the spine or the plateau, and that's called the Great Moderation. And that's because there wasn't it was like profitability was very pedestrian. There weren't very many banks being formed. There weren't very many banks that were failing because there was a very low risk appetite because everybody had lived through the Great Depression. But then you have that little bump up at the end, that little tail, and then it kind of comes down. Well, that tail is caused by, that came in the wake of the energy crisis in 1973. There was a buildup in Euro dollars offshore that the banks were like, oh, like let's go arbitrage that. And, and then the, that caused a whole bunch of things like the SNL crisis, the, uh, the LDC, all these crises in the 1980s. Then they caused regulation change that allowed banks to bank over interstate lines and to have branches. And then that opened the way to consolidation, which is why we've been on a downward slope ever since then. So two points on this. The first point is that this whole bubble that you see here, this whole, all that superstructure that's up off that, up, up, up off the, uh, the X axis right there, that is all a function of the birth of disposable income. And we've just been working our way backwards from that ever since, okay? Because you don't need very many banks because money is perfectly fungible. A dollar right. is a dollar is a dollar is a dollar is a dollar, right? And so one of the reasons we have so many panics is because we have so much competition. So everybody's trying to one-up each other and give better rates on loans and all this kind of stuff, you know? And so we're still coming off of that. So the question is, is how far do we go? Do we, do we get down to four, like you said, like Canada? Do we get down to like, you know, like 400, right. like Russia? How far do we go? And here's what it's a function of, I believe. If you look at the, where the banks are aggregated in the United States, where are they? They're in Iowa, Illinois, uh, Minnesota, Ohio, uh, Indiana. And why are they aggregated there? Because that's where our, the, our farm country is. Our best farm country is there. You have all these little farms all throughout, throughout all these states. And so why does that matter for banking? Well, when you lend on a farm, it's very bespoke. You have to know the farmer. You got to know the farmer's kid. You got to know if they take care of the equipment. You got to know if like 
what the irrigation and the water rights are like. You got to know if like looking at the land, yeah, they may have 50 acres, but like maybe those eight acres in the back, like are, uh, there's an indentation and water collects there. So that, that impacts the yield of, the, of, of those acres, right? You, you have to know all of these things. And there's just FinTech and all this kind of technology stuff. Just, it, it's just not there yet, any, even anywhere close to be able to do that. So what that means is that so long as we have all these little farms throughout the United States, there's going to be a lot of banks. But two things could change that. One, either technology. Or two, if in the agricultural industry, there is consolidation down to where these big companies come and take over all these little farms, well, then those companies will spread the risk themselves. And they won't need banks to spread the risk. So a bank will just, could do a big, big bank, could just big, make big loans to the big company, and then it will spread that risk across, across the property. So the function of, so the number of banks in the United States, to wrap it up, in my opinion, is primarily a function of consolidation. Consolidation banking is primarily a function of consolidation in agriculture. It, could it be, uh, could it be could it be like even more than that john like like maybe like even like definitely what you're saying like the local bank knows the lay of the land and like what acres are good and, and just what, what what how many acres is good on a farm but like in texas maybe that's like energy related instead of maybe agricultural related or in in florida maybe like uh tourism related uh you know on the beaches or something and, and it just almost like the every locality has their uh, strength and a lot of that is agriculture 100 percent but almost like you know uh you know out west and you know in wyoming it could be a ranch or something but like almost like it, it could just be like that local knowledge of the local economy uh just goes a long way like right that's right I and mean, it's because to your point the other area where you see these small banks dominating is in small business lending which is also very bespoke. Um, so, you know, there will always be a time and a place for these smaller institutions in terms of the lending side. The question is, is whether they're able to hold up the trust and confidence on the deposit side. Right. John, let me ask you one more question. Uh, since the financial crisis, I mean, growth has been like phenomenal, right? Like, like last year, notwithstanding. Um, you know, and I feel like a lot of uh, investors, especially retail investors, worship at the altar of growth. And and I don't even like, you know, uh, especially newer investors, and I, I don't fault them at all um, because like it has been phenomenal. And I'm not saying uh, that's not a factor still. Like I still think growth is like one of the key things uh, when I look at companies like that. That's something I'm looking at. And yet with financial institutions um, like it you know, I, I, it's different, right? And we've kind of already hinted at this, but it's almost like uh, fast growth is, is almost like a red flag. Um, like, you know, I, I've heard you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mangle this quote. So, so like when I, when I, you know, please correct me, but like, you know, like every other company manages scarcity and, but banks manage uh, abundance. Um, so like, is fast growth like a, a red flag at financial institutions? The easy answer to the question is yes, it's a major red flag in a financial institution. And that comes down, here's the best way that I've come to think about it. And running a typical business is like being on the planet Earth and that where the struggle is to get off the ground, to jump up off the ground against gravity. That's what the struggle is. A bank is completely opposite. It is like being on the moon and where you, the struggle is to stay on the ground, to stay on the ground. And so this is all reduces to demand dynamics, okay? You run a shoe store, you drop the price of shoes to $1 uh, a pair. You're going to sell a lot of shoes, but you're not going to sell an infinite number of shoes because like you and me only have so much room for shoes. I would buy whatever, eight shoes, whatever, whatever it is. Right, I mean, right. 10, right. I'm not going to buy 10,000, right? Well, you drop the price of a loan far enough and you drop the price and the terms and you make them, e you ease them in, uh, up enough uh, I mean, like you're talking like you could literally that that demand curve will just go shoot, just shoot straight up. There's an infinite amount you can do. You can walk through a mathematical proof to show that it, is, it would be rational for you to be like, I would like if I came to you and say, oh, Matt, like I would I'll make a loan to you for one percent interest uh, and uh, non recourse. And you don't have you don't have to pay. You can keep rolling it over at your will. 
the rational thing for you to do in that situation is, and I say, how much do you want? The rational thing for you to say is, you know what, John, I'll go ahead and take an infinite number of dollars. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And so right. it's like, that is why, that is why it's you. So you can grow as fast as you want because the demand is there, but then you, what happens is you go out and you make bad loans. And then because of the leverage in banking, it doesn't take much. And then you, you just, you completely fail. Gotcha. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, last time you were on, we, uh, I asked you if there's any like uh, small banks out there that are off investors radar. We talked a, a little about Triumph Financial. Uh, let me ask you again, like, are there any, uh, what, what's a, what's a gem? Like what's a, what's a one of these like banks out there that, uh, you know, there's 4,500 in the U S obviously not all publicly traded. What's another like bank that you think might be well run that like investors could look at for, for more research or, you know, for, for more diligence. Well, let me say that. So I, I again, I, I, I assess banks, not only on the performance, but also on the people who run them. Um, Hingham Institution for Savings, HIFS, is one of my favorites. Um, I just in like Massachusetts, right? And yep, and out in, in a little suburb of, of Boston, out in the south of Boston. Um, I just have so much faith and trust in in Patrick Goggin and his father Bob Goggin. Um, they've run banks for three generations. I just I find them just impeccably honest um, and, and level headed people, and very 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 intelligent. I think they're excellent bankers. So that's one. Aaron Graft, we talked about last time at Triumph Financial. I just, I think the world of Aaron Graft, I, he is like, he is an exceptional individual. Like the way he thinks, how he makes decisions, um, the the courage that, the courage with which he, he applies to a job and how he does things. Let me give you an example. Like when the market was really coming down hard on technology companies and his is kind of a technology company in the banking space, they decided that they wanted to do uh, uh, their quarterly earnings calls on Zoom. And the first one they did was literally right when all those, those stocks were tanking. And so, and you know, and I know, because we've been through this whole thing, like learning how to use Zoom and on videos and like, it just, there are yeah. And the first time you do it, it's gonna it's not going to look great. And there's nothing you can do about that, you know? But they went ahead and did it, even though they did it that quarter. And it's just like, it was the right thing to do because it allows somebody like me to assess the individuals that run this thing. Because I can see them, you can, you know what I mean? Like, it's the right thing sure. to do. But it was a hard time to do it, but he went ahead and did it. And so I have, I have a ton of respect uh, for Aaron Graft, how he does that. A guy named Brent Beardall up at a bank in uh, Washington. It's called Washington Federal. Just exceptional, exceptional performance. Brent was actually just randomly in a, a close friend of mine, but it, it's an exceptional bank. I mean, I, I get to know like the really good banks, you know, yeah, you know yeah. I don't yeah. kind of play with the other ones. And um, it's an exceptional bank. And Brent is just, he's just a wonderful leader, just incredible guy. Everybody loves Brent. He's the type of guy that 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 you want to work for, and that shows through in the performance of that of the institution. And then the last one I would say is um, the last one I would say is um, I mean, there's some private ones I like a lot, but you get the investors can't invest in them. But right. M and T Bank, what well, Renee Jones? So Renee Jones stepped into that position, and after Bob Wilmers died at the end of 2017, and Bob Wilmers was like a legend among legends in the banking industry. If you rank every every publicly traded bank by total all time shareholder return. He ranked first. I mean, he was he just a legend. And so the question was, is was Renee going to be able to fill those shoes? And I've always loved, thought very highly of Renee, but like it, it was almost an impossible thing to ask anybody to fill those shoes. But Renee has not only done that. I mean, it's the way he has managed this interest rate environment is just absolutely masterful. They just sat with like 50 billion, 40 some billion dollars in cash on their balance sheet. And all these analysts and all these investors tell them, invest that money, invest that money, invest that money. And Renee just said, we are not investing that in these, these securities because we will get destroyed when interest rates go up. And look what just happened. Wow. He, wow. All the big banks in the United States, and it was the one, I mean, it just blew everybody away. I mean, nobody was even close. Um, and so like, if if that hasn't proved that Renee Jones is the real deal um, and really is kind of one of the leaders now of, of kind of this this generation of bankers, sure. then I don't know what would prove it. So that's the last, last one. That's tip, That ticker is uh, MTB. Oh, that's great. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a great call. Uh, John, thank you so much for joining us today. If listeners or viewers are interested in more and in, uh, following you and in, in reading your work, where can they find you? So the, the two places, uh, Twitter, Maxfield on banks. Um, and then I just started, we were talking, you mentioned this earlier, I started a Substack, and I've done an enormous amount of research over the past 15 months. And I'm, going to start rolling it out on this Substack. 
So if you are an investor in banks, uh, you, you think banking is interesting, or you're a banker, and you want to kind of really be a part of the conversation about what's going on in the, on the cutting edge in terms of like how these things are run and the performance and all that kind of stuff. This is my Substack, Maxfield on banks at substack.com is, is one that you're going to want to follow. And uh, let me let me endorse that. Like, um, you know, there's, there's a paid tier and a free tier. If nothing else, sign up for that free tier. You, you, you actually have you have nothing to lose. And uh, like just a, just a free post up right now. And you just started it are uh, are great and full of like some really great like overview overviews of what's happening and like the banking industry. Uh, John, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my pleasure, Matt. It's always, always fun. I'm Matthew Cochran, a lead advisor at 7 Investing, where it is our mission to empower you to invest in your future. Have a great day, everyone.